please feel free to do so. Our guest from FEMA today is Deb Wolgamott from FEMA. And we also have Jim Vinson from the Small Business Administration here to answer questions. Uh, he's their public affairs representative. And from there, I'm gonna turn it over to Deb for her presentation and some remarks. Deb, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a short uh, presentation and it basically goes through what FEMA does and the guidelines that we use um, to follow it. And um, so if everyone's ready, I'm ready to begin. So the first part with FEMA is everything starts at the lowest level at the time of the disaster, which means it starts with your voluntary agencies with you know, your mass shelters and feeding, uh, medical needs, emergency assistance, that type of things. Then the person that might be affected, they would go through their insurance. And both of these happen prior to FEMA. Now they might only apply later on because they think that they're gonna apply with FEMA first and then their insurance, but they should always be applying with their insurance first and have a, a denial. Um, and then it goes on to the FEMA programs and we do the temporary housing, um, home repair, medical, dental, and funeral, and moving and storage. Then we move on to SBA programs, which is the real property loans, because FEMA, you know, has a limit. Um, the max limit is 36,000 on this disaster. So if you've lost a home that's $200,000, this is the time you really need your SBA programs. Um, because you're not gonna be able to fix your house with $36,000 if you've got $200,000 worth of damages. So then we've got our regular uh, FEMA programs, which is your personal property, your transportation and your group flood insurance. We'll go into that a little bit deeper because those are all SBA dependent. And then after FEMA, we've given them all the funds we can give, we go back to the voluntary organizations where we're looking for their resources and setting up long-term recoveries for their unmet needs that we no longer can assist with. So this is the first portion with your insurance. Um, a lot of people, especially in a flood, they don't have the flood insurance, but they might have uh, in their policy, things like, um, additional living expenses, um, things like that. So we would still need um, a denial letter. So um, applicants are always referred back to their insurance first. Um, and then they would have to provide their documentation so that we could find out their eligibility. This is their general eligibility for disaster assistance. Obviously it must be in the designated counties must be their primary residence. FEMA will only assist with primary residents. They must be a US citizen, non-citizen national or a qualified alien. If someone has a child that was born here in the United States, they can register with the child's name um, and their social security number, and then um, they would have a valid registration. Um, no insurance or insufficient insurance damage that's when we obviously we need the um, denial letter or uh, settlement information because again, we cannot duplicate benefits. Um, and that's a, a thing that we'll just continue to, to um, discuss because duplicating benefits can happen in numerous ways um, and insurance is one of those. Individuals and household programs. Um, first you register and um, it was designated for that declaration and it runs for 60 days. However, we've had um, a, an extension on this disaster. So uh, that ended January 5th um, of this year. And the, uh, the process lasts for 18 months. Um, now, hopefully, you know, people have put in their documents and everything so that we're able to assist and get them paid as quickly as possible so that they can start working on their recovery. 
The individuals and household programs are broken out into two different sections. One is the housing assistance, the other is, on, um, is ONA, other needs assistance, and we're gonna go into that a little bit deeper. Um, but the most important thing that we all need to remember is the individual and households program is not intended to make a survivor whole, but rather to um, cover extraordinary expenses and to meet a survivor's basic needs and is meant to supplement insurance and assistance provided by other disaster recovery programs. That is something that everybody needs to keep always in mind because people expect FEMA to be insurance and we are not. So it is imperative that that message get out there. Um, our program maximum is $36,000. Um, and then we've got the other needs assistance, which would also equal $36,000. Um, there is no maximum amount for access and functional needs. However, those are needs that they had and lost during the disaster. These are not new access and functional needs. Um, there's no amount, um, maximum amount for rental assistance, however, that does not mean that the rental amount is, um, is, there's not a maximum amount. We go by the fair market rent. So when we say no maximum amount, that's up to the 18 months. So it would depend on where you're located, what um, county you're in, um, which would be your fair market rent. So sometimes that would go over uh, what normally it would have been in uh, years past. Then uh, another big question, it says maximum amount changes each year according to the consumer price index. That amount, that 36,000 goes by that. But the other thing that goes by the consumer price index is personal property. So someone says, I lost my $6,000 couch, but FEMA's only given me 200. We go by the consumer price index, not the actual cost that somebody um, paid for their furnishings. Housing assistance, we've got repairs and replacement, and those funds will go out depending on what the inspection says. If the inspection says there's no habitability repairs required, um, they may not get much at all. Then there's some that will have the maximum amount uh, and they'll still need additional assistance. And that's when you've got your vows will step in long-term recovery and hopefully SBA. Um, temporary housing is your rental assistance and your lodging expenses. Uh, this disaster, we have a lot of people in the hotels. However, um, that's being run through the uh, non-congregate sheltering, but then we have those that are paying for the lodging themselves. So they would be able to turn in those expenses um, in the beginning until they're housed. Then we have, well, things are new now because of COVID, but we have um, different loss verification methods. One is on-site um, and the other is the virtual. Then you have the geospatial and they sometimes, in a major flooded area or fire area um, where everything is just gone, uh, they don't need to do an, an insight. They, they don't. They can just look and get all the addresses and it's all determined at that time through their preliminary damage assessments. Uh, the remote inspections, that um, is also when they're applying for FEMA, they're asked what type of damage do they have? And it would be like a triage one, two, or three. And that also determines how quickly the inspector needs to be inspecting that particular property. So, um, and here's, here's, it goes into more detail about what I was talking about. So, oops, I'm sorry. Um, under normal conditions, you know, the inspector would walk through the home to assess and record the damages. However, as we see, there are uh, cir extenuating circumstances that will sometimes not allow that. And um, we would use uh, aerial imaging and uh, video val validations and things like that. So um, 
that's that. Um, Jim, would you like to talk about SBA or do you want me to just continue through on my um, overview? If just, yeah, if, if I could just give a quick soundbite and then I'll turn it back over to you as you scroll through the slides. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for inviting SBA to this meeting. It's always a pleasure to uh, brief leadership from New Jersey as well as any disaster survivors that were impacted by this, in this, by this incident. As you know, SBA um, Office of Disaster Assistance is always here for disaster assistance when the president declares an incident, as well as when there's smaller uh, disasters that maybe uh, SBA would come out on their own. Um, keep in mind that the SBA, uh, even though the name says Small Business Administration, we give assistance to businesses of all sizes, homeowners, renters, and private nonprofits that can qualify for this incident. Uh, it has to be within the incident period as well as some other criteria. But uh, my name is James Benson. I go by Jim, and I'll pass it back over to you, Debbie. Thank you so much, Jim. Okay, so these are the types of assistance that SBA offers, which would be for personal property, transportation, and group flood. That is what I talked about earlier when I said some items are SBA dependent. So um, the applicant would have to apply, um, become ineligible from SBA, and then it would be pushed back to FEMA for possible grant assistance. This is the... Um, ONA that we had talked about, where we've got the non-SBA dependent, and then we've got the SBA dependent. Non-SBA are the funeral expenses, medical expenses, dental expenses, moving expenses, and other expenses um, that are set up prior to, um, well, actually at the time that it's declared. So it could be the smoke detectors, humidifiers, and all of those type of things. Remember, all of these items must be disaster related. Uh, the disaster recovery centers, we had quite a few of them on this disaster, as well as we had EMRICs on site, which were the mobile units, um, because we had some areas that were impacted that we couldn't put um, there was no place for us to put a disaster recovery center, so we brought one in ourselves. Um, and they are a one-stop center for registration and information. Um, they are a league of information for everybody that comes in. The people that are there are able to look up their registrations and find out what their eligibility codes are, what their problems were, so that hopefully they can um, support them and facilitate getting all of their documents um, submitted to FEMA on time. Um, our DRC operations is facilities. Um, there have to be, they have to have heat, electricity, lighting, water, restrooms and adequate parking, uh, appropriate emergency fire and medical. Uh, the facilities must be centrally located in a community to minimize travel time. Consideration must be given to the most vulnerable population. Uh, where app applicable DRC should be established on a public transportation route. Again, there was a lot of flooding in this area, so EMRICs were, um, the mobile units were used on this disaster quite, quite a bit, actually. Our community services program, that's your crisis counseling, disaster legal services, disaster unemployment, and disaster case management. The crisis counseling, um, that program, it looks like it's being awarded any day. Um, so that will take care of, the goal is to aid the survivors in their recovery from adverse um, to disasters and to rebuild their lives. The prior to FEMA awarding uh, disaster case management, I mean, crisis counseling, we use our voluntary agencies like um, New Jersey Hope and Healing and um, um, those type of items. Okay, your disaster unemployment, that is good until March. And that obviously is exactly what it says it is um, to assist with that. Disaster legal services. I'm actually just gonna move to the next slide on this one because 
It talks about the types of items that they can contact Disaster Legal Services for that information. Disaster case management that promotes partnership um, for the disaster survivor and a case manager that they have applied for, the state has applied for it, and we're still waiting for an approval on that one. Then we have our voluntary agency liaisons. We have one here in the room and they're, um, they help with building the relationships among the public, private and voluntary sectors. They are the resource that the I, uh, individual and household uh, program, we go to them, especially when we get somebody that had $200,000 worth of damage and we gave them 36,000. They've already applied for a loan. So it, they are a, um, the right arm to um, the individuals and assistance. And then we've got the long-term recovery groups, which they are working on now. Funding is really tight, um, but that's a co coalition of local agencies, nonprofits, volunteers, and faith-based faith and community to assist the individuals and families recover from a disaster. Um, these are wonderful resources right here for um, what FEMA does above and beyond. And that is all I have. Great, thank you so much, Deb. Thank Again, you. if you have a question uh, related to this presentation, first, please ask your question using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have a few in right now. I'm gonna go into some FAQs, but again, if you have a question, please click the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a mobile or an iPad, click the three dots at the bottom right, um, and then hit chat. And please uh, let me know your question as well as what town you are from. Um, but let's start off with a few frequently asked questions. These might have been covered in the presentation, but they're clearly top of mind. So I just want to make sure these are reiterated. All right, for either Deb or for you, Jim, what does a nonprofit need to qualify for FEMA assistance? That would be Jim. Now you stated FEMA assistance, correct? I did, but it seems like this would be SBA assistance. Isn't that correct? Not necessarily true because uh, private nonprofits uh, fall in the realm of uh, public assistance as well, unless they're categorized by FEMA as a non-critical. For instance, I don't wanna to speak too much on the FEMA program, but if it's a hospital, it's a critical private nonprofit possibly, and FEMA would take care of that through their public assistance grants. If they're classified as a non, critical private nonprofit like a nursing home, or um, uh, we recently uh, assisted a, a, a private non, a non-critical private nonprofit in New Jersey, which was helping give uh, assistance to uh, homeless folks uh, as far as uh, materials to live in, uh, as well as vehicles and so forth. When they uh, classified and sent to us, referred to us from FEMA as a non-critical private nonprofit, um, the qualifications are basic. It's just a, a low interest rate loan that we uh, provide. The application process is rather simple. It can be done electronically. It can be done in any disaster recovery center or business recovery center that we open during the incident period there in New Jersey with assistance from a reservist, or it can be from the 1-800 line to give a paper application for the person to uh, fill out and we can walk you through it. The bottom line, it's very simple application. Things such as, you know, uh, what the private nonprofit is, um, if they have an EIN number. We also ask for a social security number to uh, do verification on the maybe the CEO that's applying as well as the company that's applying. And the, the uh, thing that we ask, and I wanna stress this for all applications for SBA. Um, sometimes folks think of us as a bank. And we're actually not a bank, we're the opposite. We go to the field during disaster incidents to try our best to get a loan across with the information we're giving from, we're given from businesses of all sizes, homeowners, renters, and private nonprofits. And our qualifications are very, 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 very low. 
Uh, we ask folks to don't worry about, well, we get these answers. My credit score. Well, I actually had a bankruptcy a while back. Well, I really don't make a lot of money. What does that mean? That really doesn't mean a lot because what we want you to do, and it's so critical, is to apply. Because when you apply for a disaster loan with SPA, you, the applicant, the disaster survivor, is in the driver's seat. There is no penalty. Nothing goes against your credit ratings. Oh, he's asking for a loan or they're asking for a loan. None of that happens because in a time of need, such as these disasters, you're borrowing money from the U.S. Treasury, which is your money, my money, and everybody else's money for a time of need. And they're very low interest rate loans for, for very long terms, fixed. So we ask that everybody multitask, okay? And the, and the process for SBA, don't wait for your insurance to make a decision. Don't wait for FEMA to make a decision. Don't wait for a state agency to make a decision on your case. Go ahead and apply at the same time you come into the center and see all those different agencies. Because while you do that, the process goes through. And then if you are approved, guess what? You can take the loan, you can take some of the loan, or you can say, no, thank you. My insurance company just came to the table and provided all the assistance I need. Thank you very much. And there's no penalty, no foul, no issues. Now, if you take the loan, the only time it would ever ever, ever show up on a credit rating for a disaster survivor that took the loan would be naturally if they didn't pay it back. But other than that, it doesn't help your credit score and it doesn't hurt your credit score if you have a disaster loan with SBA and you're always in good standings. So did I answer your question on the private nonprofit? It's very, very important how they're classified through FEMA. I believe okay. you answered that question perfectly. Deb, do you have any additions to add? Yeah, I forgot when, um, because you know it's, it's outside my program area, but the nonprofits also, like he was talking about, if it's a nonprofit, say it's a hospital or something like that, they apply through our public assistance um, programs. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you both. All right, another question um, we had a few times uh, are you allowed to cancel FEMA disaster assistance loan benefits without penalty under certain circumstances? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but um, I'm going to answer it to the, to the way I think you're asking. So if they applied for an SBA loan and um, it was accepted and they want to deny it so that they can get a, a grant for personal property, they will not get a grant for personal property. That has to be denied by SBA in order for it to be given back to FEMA for a possible grant. Does that yeah, answer I, your question? If I could add just a little bit more to that, Debbie, and thank you for your comments on that. Okay, Because there was a mixture of terminology. Um, if we could make this real simple, when you look at FEMA, which I don't like to speak a lot about their programs, it's think of it as grant of money that's given to you based on their regulations and procedures that's given to the disaster survivor that qualifies and it never has to be paid back. Now, when we use the term loan, on disaster loans, the Federal Disaster Loan Program is owned by SBA. It's congressionally mandated and there's rules and regulations that Congress goes over periodically and Based on the question that was asked, it's like I mentioned earlier in my comment, if you apply, which we highly encourage disaster survivors to do, they really need to. If FEMA refers you to us, the best thing you can do for yourself and your family and your property that you're trying to get back to near normal is to apply. And it's a very simple process. Then let the process flow. If it becomes a point where you're approved and you do not want to take it, such as the term that was used in the question, cancel it, there's no harm done. Keep in mind, if you are approved for an SBA loan, 
SBA and you cancel it, SBA will not refer you to other needs assistance, which many times is FEMA and many times it's state agencies that depend on our databases on the disaster survivors that registered and applied. Let's say a little bit later on, like in, in Sandy, New Jersey had some excellent grant programs from the state of New Jersey based on federal funds that were given to them for them to handle. The first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna do a data sharing with SBA. They're gonna ask us, please, a memorandum of understanding, please share the data, who applied, not a, not a lot of sensitive information, but who applied and who received my funds, funds number one, and who received uh, determination letters that they couldn't get in a loan. Those are key factors. And then they can move on to grant funds that the state has. And also if they didn't receive a loan, sometimes you know in the Northeast, particularly up in, in the New England states and your state, that uh, a $200,000 loan to repair a home many times doesn't even cover it. Homes are very expensive these days and the damage could be very high. So you can supplement it with some type of state program or other federal entity that brings along a grant. So if the home is like 350,000, I'm using simple math now folks, and you're approved for a $200,000 loan that's maxed out, 40,000 for personal property, 200,000 for fur repairs, et cetera. And then a grant fund comes in and finishes off your roof for you for another 150,000, et cetera. That's perfect. There is no duplication of benefits. Now, the other example on the flip side, if I hope I don't take up too much of your time on this, if you were approved for a $200,000 loan for SBA and you had 200,000, I mean, you're approved for the loan of your damages and it equaled $200,000, okay? And you repaired your home. And then several months later, the insurance comes in and says, hey, you had adjudicated damages and we're going to give you a check for $200,000. Well, that would be duplication of benefits. So that $200,000 would come to you, but it would be checked first with SBA because you took a loan out with SBA and your insurance company would know this. And then we would adjudicate it and say, yes, we we gave them a loan for $200,000 to repair all the damages and they're back to normal. That loan, that check from the insurance company would go straight to SBA and pay off your loan. No harm, no foul, early payoff. So those are really, really, really nice things in the program that are built in your favor as a disaster survivor. I hope I answered that question because it used the words FEMA and loan which pretty much aren't interchangeable. The loan side of the house is their federal partner, SBA. Thanks, Jim. All right, let's take one more FAQ and then we'll go into some live questions. For our final FAQ for either Deb or Jim, I have submitted an appeal online and now I have heard that I needed to send it via email, sorry, via mail or fax. Have I missed the opportunity? No, um, they have not. Um, the appeal process, if they set up online, then they can continue to do everything online. The biggest thing about doing it online is they must remember to submit the documents that will uh, support their appeal. If they don't have access to a computer, then please mail it in or fax it in. Again, you must submit an appeal with your supporting documentation so that FEMA can, can um, move, move forward with processing. Does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. If I could, if I could add just a tidbit to that to make sure we, we cover everybody that's really asking this question. Um, that would go, what Deb said would go hand in hand with SBA. Let's say the disaster survivor applied for an SBA loan and they, did not uh, uh, see, uh, uh, receive the loan, they were declined. But then maybe a little a couple weeks later or something, or the loan wasn't sufficient to cover the damages for some reason, 
they can always do what's called an appeal or reconsideration in the same manner. It could be via email, it could be via uh, regular US mail or normal correspondence with the loan officer that gave them the information that said, well, at this time we can't give you a loan based on your current financial situation. Uh, there's lots of variabilities that we probably couldn't go into it in this short amount of time, but reconsideration and appeals are also available for SBA applications. Because keep in mind, many times damages are over the $36,000 limit that a grant maybe could provide, maybe, and I don't speak that lane very much. Um, but then again, we could always get reconsiderations and appeals. The key piece to this is once the application is in by the deadline, you have up to two years for reconsiderations and um, appeals, over. Thanks both. All right, we're gonna go right into some live questions. Again, if you have a question in regards to the presentation or anything that we've touched upon here today, please use the chat feature to first ask your question and include your name and the town you are from along with the question. We are refraining from taking questions that involve individual casework. Um, so if you do have personal information you need to share with us, please reach out to our casework page and our um, constituent service representatives at malinowski.house.gov slash casework. First up, we have Catherine from Montgomery. Catherine, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead with your question. So I had a question about the rental assistance that's available through FEMA. There was a note that the, there's no maximum, but that the rent is determined by the uh, fair market value for rent uh, based on your area. I was wondering if that is publicly available information so that as we're looking for rentals, uh, we'd have an idea of what we could possibly be getting back from FEMA versus what we are gonna, we'll need to budget as paying out of pocket. Hi, uh, this is Debbie again. Yes, that is public information and that is on the HUD uh, fair market uh, rent for 2021. And the reason it's for 2021 is that is the time of the disaster. Does that answer your question? Yes, so even if the rental assistance will need to continue into 2022, we'd still be looking at the maximum value for uh, 20, based on 2021 rent. And that's that is, it on HUD website? Yes, ma'am. And that on the HUD website, it breaks it down by county um, and it breaks it down by bedrooms. So if they had a two bedroom occupied, which is the way we figured it out, is if it's a two bedroom occupied in say Montgomery, Montgomery County, the fair market uh, value will be on that website. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Next up, we have Nancy from Lambertville. Nancy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so at the start of this, I actually was really excited and hopeful because um, it seemed like the process flow, um, I thought maybe I had misunderstood something um, throughout my journey here. But now as I'm listening to um, you build out on some of the questions, um, I think it's becoming more clear. So I just wanna make sure um, that I'm understanding you. So when it comes to an SBA loan, um, you apply and they come out, they do the inspection and they say, okay, yes, you're approved for X amount at X percentage. And as the homeowner, the consumer, um, you have that choice to proceed with the loan or to decline it. Um, and you know, everyone's personal situation is going to be unique. Um, let's say you decline the SBA assistance because the, the rates are the same that you can get at a local bank. Um, and then there's that ease of access, right? You can go to a local bank, you have that dedicated point person rather than managing through you know, a government um, loan process. So once the moment you decline that loan, you no longer qualify, my understanding, you no longer qualify for any grants or these extra um, resources that you guys highlighted earlier in the presentation. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Okay. Um, okay, so if they did not have insurance, um, and they home repair the $36,000 may still be available to this person. 
Um, I don't want to go into any specific because it, then it, it, you know, if, every case is so unique. But if they were found eligible through FEMA for home repair and for maybe possibly ineligible insured items like um, furnace, well, septics, um, well, furnaces and wells are, are insured if it's uh, not wells, but furnaces are if it's not a flood event. But um, we would assist with that. The home repair that you might be talking about is when I said we could possibly assist up to 36,000, but they had $200,000 worth of damage. That's when for the additional funds that you may need to repair your home, that's when SBA comes in handy. Right, and if I could add, uh, apologies for my sound like you wouldn't qualify for FEMA. I don't never ever want to speak about FEMA programs. But what happens is when you're referred to SBA, uh, let's say they're giving you your rental as assistance and some of the other assistance that you need immediately. Of course, those items, uh, SBA's determination does not affect those IHP programs. What it does affect though, is if you're looking for additional assistance from another federal entity or a state entity, it's gonna be their determination on what the program is if you're, ex if you're approved for a home loan for SBA. I didn't hear you mention, um, I was curious about this. You did mention you can go to a local bank for a point of contact with the same interest rate that SBA offers. Um, the thing about SBA interest rates is determined at the time of the incident. So for that quarter, if it's the fourth quarter of the, uh, of the year and the interest rate is uh, 1.75, which I, if my memory serves me correctly, was which was the interest rate for this particular incident. That's a fixed rate for 30 years. Um, there's many banks that will even touch that. But again, I'm not trying to compete with any local banks or anything like that, but the uh, eight to nine years I've been doing this, I have very rarely seen a local for-profit bank that can beat the uh, interest rates that's fixed for disaster relief. Again, that's what's nice about this is the disaster survivor can do the research, just as you mentioned, uh, and determine how they want to approach it. And each financial situation is unique. Yeah, and that was our understanding when we initially applied, applied because it was, I'll say, advertised as being a, an amazing rate. It was in the one point somethings. Um, but then when, it, when we went through the process, um, it was significantly higher and was in line with what a local bank um, would do, uh, you know, a, a loan at. Um, okay, so I mean, uh, I think you've answered my question. I can always follow up um, via this uh, casework site um, to review our case uh, specifically. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Next up, we have Sayum from Somerset County. Can you hear us? Apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Sayum. That's all right, we'll move on to the next person. Next up, we have Ray from Delaware Township. Ray, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Thank you for having this forum to answer our questions and uh, kind of unfold the mysteries of how to deal with this disaster. Um, my wife and I live on a small farm, a uh, 22 acre farm, uh, just up from the town of Stockton. Uh, during the Ida storm, we had a torrent of uh, rain uh, water uh, come down the road and pour into um, a ravine that's at the bottom of our property uh, near the road. And basically it eroded or uh, scoured about 10 feet on both sides of this small ravine. It just washed out the topsoil. Uh, so now the ravine, you know, it used to be four feet deep and now it's six feet more deep and it lost on both sides about 10 feet of soil. Uh, the washout is also approaching some other large trees that are you know, coming up you know, in, the, in the firing line of that, uh, that ravine. 
So um, we also had some large gouges in our gravel drive uh, from the water coming off the road. And um, my wife applied for FEMA assistance. We had an inspector come. We received uh, an $871 uh, payment to repair the driveway, but uh, we never got anything conclusive on the, um, the ravine, whether it's covered, whether uh, how we could um, create something like a wall. There are these gabion cage walls with stones in to just stop the erosion along the curves of the ravine uh, from occurring next time we have a storm. So I'm not sure how to proceed. I see that you have an appeal process or a reconsideration process. Is that the best advice to go to return and go through a reconsideration on our property? Deb, I believe all that question was for you. Okay, um, that was a personal uh, case. So uh, could you please put that through? Um, Congress, Congressman Malinowski's office, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Does it cover landscape? That's a general question. That was. So does it cover uh, uh, soil property and we, we erosion? We we are a farm, um, and uh, basically part of our land is lost. In general, hypothetically, does it cover erosion? I'm sorry, could, could you hear that question from my wife? Let's say hypothetically, does uh, FEMA cover this type of damage to the landscape? Um, again, if you could please put your request in because hypothetically will put me on the spot and without an inspection of the properties and to find out the habitability, um, I don't wanna be put onto the spot and say, yes, we do, and then we don't. So if you could please put that through the Congressman's office. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to try Sayum again from Somerset County. Can you hear uh, us? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, my question is that I got approval from the SBA loan, but they told me that because I can pay the loan because of my amount my tech, whatever the credit score or something, has two out of three criteria. So they cannot provide a lower interest rate, like 1.57, such should be the designated loan interest rate, but they provide me 3.125. Uh, I wonder what's the case for these kind of things. Okay. I can't speak specifically about your case, but here's the SBA loan program. Every time we go into a disaster incident, whether it's a presidential declaration or an agency, there's always gonna be straight up front two interest rates. There's one that for people that can't get credit elsewhere, which was, I believe the 1.75 for this declaration. I'll have to pull up my notes because the declaration's already passed and I moved on to Alabama, but I can, I can pull that up quickly and it should, it's common access. The second column, when you're getting a briefing or you're looking at what we call our fact sheet, uh, there's, uh, there's the fixed interest rate that people that can get credits elsewhere, they'll show that area. And that's determined based on your specific individual financial situation. And that's done through our loan officer that takes a look at that. And something must have been in your package that uh, either gave you the low interest rate loan or fixed rate or the other interest rate column on the fact sheet. Uh, there's, and that's strictly on the individual cases based on your ability and your financial situation. If you, I can always, you can always appeal, you can always uh, ask for reconsideration and so forth. If you want, you can submit it through the congressman's uh, page as well or goes directly to your loan officer. Thanks so much, I'll do that. Yes, sir, Thank have you. a great day. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you both. Next up, we have Sarah from Flemington. Sarah, can you hear us? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi, thanks again for doing this because I've been wondering this and trying to get people on the phone 
for a very long time now, months. And uh, so I'm really excited about this. So first off, thank you. <laughs> um, so basically I lost my car um, in Ida and I unfortunately, I went through everything possible to try to get it fixed. There was all these problems with my insurance. Um, so it took a couple months and finally I just was, I just applied for FEMA. Um, an inspector came out and inspected my house and that gentleman was very nice. And I know that was like the first step and I uploaded a whole bunch of information, everything that was needed and, and then some um, to my account after I reg registered and went to apply. Um, so there's more than enough information there. And that was about two months ago at the end of October, beginning November. Um, and I keep going in to check if there's any updates like every other day or so, and it's still saying pending. So I'm just kind of wondering like what, how long this process takes or you know, what I'm looking for next. Hi, uh, this is FEMA again. Yes, if you could submit that to Congressman Malinowski's office, because uh, again, I can't go into any detail because I'm not looking at your case, um, but we would gladly look into it if you would submit that to his office. Okay, Thank no problem. Thanks, everyone. We're going to go back to Catherine from Montgomery for another question. We have time for just a few more. So again, if you have a question, please uh, use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get through one or two more questions before wrapping up here. But let's pass it on to Catherine from Montgomery again. Catherine, can you hey hear again. us? Um, yes. Uh, so my question is a little specific, but I can make it more general. What assistance is available either through SBA or FEMA if your municipality has said that you're legally not allowed to rebuild, repair, and re-inhabit the home that you're still, like you've got a mortgage on. Um, is there any help available if our township has said there's zoning restrictions, you're in a flood zone, you may not rebuild in a flood zone? Uh Deb, are you going to address this one? Um, yeah, that, that is kind of specific because I don't really know where your home is. However, those are like the Blue Acres and the Green Acres plans as far as buyout programs. I don't know what's available in your area, but the first place you'd have to check is with your um, Office of Emergency Management. Okay, and so... Sort of my follow up is that I know that means that an SBA loan is for repairing your home. Um, that there's obviously you're just not eligible for anything for SBA if you can't, if you're not doing money towards repairing a home. Uh, that's that's correct, Catherine. First of all, that's a very good question, and without being specific to your situation or to the neighborhood that Deb answered, again, we would have to refer you to your local emergency manager because uh, evidently the town. The county, the township, they must have some type of plan, it looks like, because whenever SBA funds are given, uh, there has to be burnt building permits and so forth to repair a home. And if you can't get a building permit, then, of course, the funds can't be dispersed. That's that's sort of what I thought, but I just wanted to, to clear that up. And um, great. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. And that was a generality. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. All right, let's go to Josh from Delaware Township. Josh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. You guys hear me okay? Yep, go ahead with your question. All right, perfect. So um, one, just to help Catherine, I think her name is, I would definitely reach out to the New Jersey Conservation uh, Foundation about Blue Acres. So that's my hint as to a good place to start with that. <laughs> um, is I know myself, I'm praying for a buyout because I'm not really 100% sure what I would do bet down. My home was destroyed uh, in Delaware Township. Um, I'm also in that same situation where the town does not want me to rebuild. So I'm, I'm also uh, open for a buyout. And I know the people at New Jersey Conservation have been more than helpful. So that would be my recommendation there. Uh, my question has to do with the appeal process. Um, you know, okay. I was given a certain... 
sorry, <laughs> I was um, given a you certain amount of money to, um, I was given a certain amount of money to do uh, inspections on my home after, you know, with my first round of, of money, I guess it was, whatever it was. I paid like three times more than that amount to do those inspections. Um, I've had um, my appeal in November and we're in January. So I guess my general question would be, how long do the appeal processes take when someone will actually get back to you? Because, um, you know, obviously I, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually in worse shape now with the appeal process than I was before because the amount of money I spent on it. Uh, so <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys can give me a little information on how long that takes for someone to review your appeal and get back to you. Uh, hi, this is Debbie again. Appeals can take up to 90 days. Um, okay. And if you want, you can, again, submit to Malinowski's office and we will look into it. However, it can take up to 90 days. But have you called the help desk just to confirm that all of your documentation has been received? I've tried. I work. And every time I call, I'm told like it's like an hour wait and I, I can't. I can't. Stop okay. Calling. Submit your request to um, Congressman Malinowski's office and we will um, once we receive it, we'll look into it and get back with you. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. All right. We are going to take one final question here. Again, if we didn't answer your question today, please reach out to our casework team. They should be able to answer a lot of your questions on individual casework. I've put that link in the chat a few times. Um, but again, this will be our final question for today. And it comes from Linda. Linda, can you hear us? Linda, do we have you? Last call for Linda. All right, no worries. Let me see if I can. Oh, well, her question was, she used a PPP loan. Um, can we now use SBA disaster funds for a nonprofit damage from Ida? Okay, that sounds like it's an SBA question. And just to keep it general terms, the Paycheck Protection Program that was offered for COVID-19 businesses by the declaration by the president those were for uh, specific funds that are very uh, strictly uh, detailed out for the guidelines. In other words, to pay employees, their paychecks and so forth. Anything that occurred with the remnants of Ida impacts to the declared disaster uh, counties that were in this declaration. Funding is totally separate. Those are two different items. Now they do take, in, if you're looking for your home or your business, they will take those on a case-by-case -case basis and you, you would apply for IDA disaster relief, whereas your PPP funds that you received was for your business, which I believe you stated was a, a private nonprofit. That was for a totally different situation for a paycheck protection program. In other words, to pay your employees and so forth. I hope I answered your question on that with staying as general as possible without your unique situation. But those are two separate programs. Thanks, Jim. And uh, with that, we have completed uh, today's conversation. We've taken all of the questions we can take today. Um, Jim or Deb, if you have any other final remarks, feel free to uh, close us out here today. Hi, this is Debbie with FEMA again. I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us. And I do hope that we were able to answer some of your questions and the, um, the means in which FEMA goes about uh, the disaster and how it starts with the lowest level and ends in the lowest level. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And for those of you that need to submit requests to Congressman Malinowski's office, once those are received, they submit them to us and um, someone will get back with you on those. So thank you all for joining us. If I could last last minute remarks for SBA as well as we're federal partners uh, with this disaster and work closely with the state Again, thank you for hosting this meeting. It's very important that we get our messaging out to everybody during this incident because uh, the intent is to give assistance to everyone that we possibly can that can qualify for our program. And um, again, also, if anybody has any questions on unique cases and so forth specific, uh, 
the congressman's office uh, will uh, channel those through FEMA and FEMA will channel them to us. Thank you very much and everybody please have a safe evening.